Good morning. How is everybody doing today? Men, have you loosened your belts one loop this morning? And uh, so much to be thankful for. I almost started breaking out in song by singing It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. But my boys are here, so I don't want to embarrass them too much. But we're so thankful to have everybody here this morning, and including if you're visiting. And if you are visiting, of course, we'd love for you to fill out one of these Let's Connect cards that's in front of you in the pew. And uh, just to know that you're here, we, we'd love to have record of that. And then also, too, on the back side of this Let's Connect card is an opportunity to fill out prayer requests for visitors and for members. And um, if you'd rather do it online, we have a QR code on here because we're just that high tech here. And so fill that out. But then also on the, the worship order, there is a QR code on here as well to where if you want to see the bulletin that we put out weekly, you can kind of access it from there and want to keep you guys connected, keep you guys plugged in. A couple of announcements this morning. Um, Katie Tripp, I think we have this up on the screen. This is exciting. Yes, Katie Tripp was baptized Sunday, November 20th by her father, Kevin Tripp. And so, yeah, praise God for that. And it was fun to see Katie after the football game Friday night. Congratulate her on that. A reminder, just a reminder that there is no children's worship this morning. We love you, parents of young children. We really do. <laughs> Utility assistance, another announcement to make here. Um, this, is a, this is a good one. Realizing that the cost for home heating and electricity have risen dramatically this year, the College Church elders are concerned about the difficulty some members may be having to pay their bills. And so we want to help. So if you or any other member of the congregation that you know of needs some assistance with above normal utility costs, please contact your shepherding group, uh, your shepherding group elder, or the church office. So we want to help if that's the case with our church members here. Another announcement this morning, um, two more that were given to me. One is from Donna Mays. Donna Mays, uh, she said her mom, Margaret Helms, had a stroke last night. And David and I are with her. She's doing fairly well, all things considered. Prayers appreciated. And then also one of our members, Chris Glaze. A lot of you will know him. Uh, he's, he's getting some tests right now in Batesville for his heart. So pray for, for Chris and his family. We love them very much. And so prayers appreciated for that. And now we have an announcement by Bob Reilly. I'm Bob Reilly, and I'm the chairman of the elders for the fall. And I'm happy to tell you I'm not on your QR code or whatever that is. <laughs> but I did get a letter of resignation from our dear Dr. John Baines over the Thanksgiving holidays. And I'd like to share that with you and thank him for his service to the college church these past 10 years. Dr. Bain says, I thank God this congregation and for each one of you can be worthy to serve as an elder to the college church. Being surrounded by so many good men and women has been an honor. In addition, thank you for your kindness to our family throughout the years, especially during Donna's prolonged illness and death. I'm resigning from the eldership today, and please pray for the next time you meet that you ask for prayers for Judy and Mitchum as we pledge our lives together in marriage on Saturday, November the 19th. They did their honeymoon in Gatlinburg, by the way. Okay. In addition, I would also ask you to prayerfully consider how to best carry out the promise we made the church in late 2018 in a letter from the elders that Dr. City read. The last paragraph reads, as elder of the college church, we're asking our full-time ministers, volunteer teachers, fathers and mothers to emphasize the sanctity of human life and biblical principles that undergird the truth in our lessons, prayers, and daily conversations. Dr. Baines has served on the Benevolence Committee, Education, Prison, and the love of his life has been our Sanctity of Life program that we've had at the College Church. I want to uh, thank Dr. Baines. He has his new wife with him, Judy, and that's 
Let's have them stand and give them a round of applause for their service to the college church. Thank you, and you can go back to your QR code if you would. Please stand as we sing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace.
Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your great and holy name. Father, we pause in our activities of life to offer up our praise to you at this time. We praise you for your creative power as expressed in the great universe that we see all round about us. We praise you for your holiness. We praise you for your love expressed by grace in the redemption of all mankind. And Father, we thank you for welcoming us into your presence at any time to offer up the concerns that are upon our hearts at a given moment. Father, you have blessed us so abundantly. We have so many things to be thankful for, but we know the greatest gift of all is your son Jesus, his coming to earth to take on human flesh, live a sinless life, and then offer himself as a sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Father, thank you for that inexpressible gift. And Father, we're thankful for the church, which was purchased at such great cost, his own very life's blood. Father, we're thankful for fellow Christians that stand by our side and offer us uh, encouragement and help us uh, walk through the travels of life that often involve travails of various kinds. Father, we're thankful for the godly men that serve this congregation as elders. And on this particular occasion, we honor John Baines for his wonderful service to this congregation. And we pray your choicest blessings to be upon him as he enters a new phase of his life. Father, we're thankful for our deacons, for our teachers, our staff members, and everyone that serves and encourages the brethren that make up this congregation. Father, we're thankful for the measure of health that allows us to be here this morning. And we're thankful for those whose health does not allow them to be physically present, and yet through the wonders of technology, they are able to be, in some sense, a part of us this day. We're thankful for that. And Father, we're so thankful for the bountiful material blessings that you shower upon us uh, every day of our lives. And Father, we pray that we would be good stewards of what you have entrusted in our care. And Father, we're thankful for the blessings of living in this wonderful country of ours, a land of freedom, opportunity, peace, and prosperity. Father, we have concerns that are up on our hearts at this time. We have, as always, a number of our congregation that are sick. Uh, we specifically note Brother Fred Jewell, uh, Judy Reynolds, uh, Barbara Garnett, Daryl Matthews, Mary Bridges, Chris Blaze that was mentioned earlier. Father, we know that there are others that are not known to us personally, but we know that you know each one uh, in an intimate way to the extent that the very hairs of one's head are numbered by you, and we pray that your blessings would be showered upon them as they have need. 
And Father, there are those among our number that have suffered loss in recent days and weeks, and we pray that your peace and comfort would be upon them. Father, we have many in our congregation that uh, might be considered aged, that uh, we are, so for those of us in that category, we understand that we are in the sunset years of our life, and we pray that your peace and well-being would be upon all of those in that situation. Father, we also pray for comfort for those that are feeling times of despair, feeling of downtrodden, discouraged with life's battles, and we pray that we might be instruments in your hands to offer encouragement, to lift them up, and to support them in whatever way. Father, as you've asked us to do, we pray for our leaders in government at all levels. We pray that they would govern with wisdom and with integrity, putting aside personal and partisan agendas and seek the best for those people that they represent. And Father, we pray that you would help us to appoint to positions of leadership men for whom godliness is a requisite and an important factor. And Father, at this time in a troubled world, we pay, pray for peace, especially uh, in the Ukraine where such travesty unfolds on a daily basis. We pray that you would intervene to the hearts of world leaders and cause them to seek avenues of peace in order that the death and destruction might, be, might cease. Father, we stand before you as weak and sinful creatures. We ask for your forgiveness, uh, not based on any merit of our own, but completely upon the saving grace of your son, Jesus. And Father, we pray that we will be willing and able and eager to forgive others as you have forgiven us. Father, we thank you for the grace that abounds for our justification, and we look forward to uh, that time when we will be united with all other believers with you in the joys of heaven. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
one of the interesting things that takes place every fall, and especially as I was teaching at Harding, was to look at the faces of the students as they anticipated the opportunity to go home for Thanksgiving. Our attendance, of course, is affected by that, but the exuberance that they express is something that is such a joy to see. Thanksgiving, of course, has been a time of gathering with family and friends. I appreciate the fact that the, co the commercial world has not overly commercialized this yet, and may they never get to that point. Eating together, that seems to be something that we as humans thoroughly enjoy. Anthropologically, rituals of eating abound throughout the world. Eating together tends to imply a camaraderie, a commonality, a solidarity, at least on a temporary basis, and an implicit trust that as we eat together, we're going to assume that person's not going to poison me. And I know that may sound trite, but uh, there is a reality to that. The Lord certainly recognized the value of feasts of various kinds. We can think of the Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, and the Feast of Weeks, and a host of others that we might note in the Old Testament record. Xenophon, you probably wouldn't have expected Xenophon in this, Xenophon, a, an ancient Greek military strategist, philosopher, and historian, has this to say in one of his works. Fellow citizens, you know, stand nearer than foreigners do. And messmates, referring to those eating around a table, nearer than those who eat elsewhere. But those who are sprung from the same seed, nursed by the same mother, reared in the same home, loved by the same parents, and who address the same persons as father and mother, how are they not the closest of all? The Bible tends to address these elements, and I'm not at all suggesting that the Bible got these ideas from Xenophon. But Xenophon's remarks indicate that there is a wide-ranging recognition of those tenets. Paul addresses the issue in Corinthians when he says, Don't humiliate those who have nothing. And he upbraids the Corinthians because of their status aspects. We are fellow citizens, for in Christ Jesus we are all children of God through faith. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Secondly, we have sprung from the same seed, the mind of God. And Peter writes, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. We have been raised in the family of God. John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The table of the Lord's Supper is a table where we are reminded of, our one, our common plight. We were sinners destined to be lost. But because of the great love to us, we are forgiven of our sins through the blood of Jesus, God's Son. With this, we have nothing about which to boast except that we have been loved by God. And we come to him through Jesus as those whom he has redeemed. The simplicity of this meal reminds us of our need, of his grace, and of our sharing as the family of God. Will you bow with me?
Dear Lord, we are so grateful for the great love that you have extended to us through the person of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. And we are so grateful for the opportunity to know you through him, him and his revelation and your revelation. And we thank you for the sacrifice on the, on the cross that gives us the opportunity, regardless of from where we have come, regardless of our status in this life, to come to you through the body and blood of Jesus, our Savior. Be with us as we partake of this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Bow with me again, please. Dear Father, you have revealed to us that the life is in the blood and that Jesus shed his life for us. We recognize that we were not worthy to receive that except for the fact that you have loved us. And we are grateful for that extension offered to us. Bless us as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which reminds us of how deep your love is for us. In Jesus' name, amen. For me, one of the most moving episodes in the pages of the gospel is when Jesus is at the temple and people are contributing their funds and this poor widow woman comes and deposits two mites into the treasury. A denarius in the ancient world was the equivalent of a day's wages for a day worker. And the two mites that Jesus says was all that she had was equivalent to one one hundred twenty-eighth of a denarius. She gave the very last. And yet, in the eyes of God, she was just as valuable as any of the others. As children of God, one of the responsibilities that we have is not only, of course, to try to spread the gospel to reach those who are lost, but also to assist those who are in need. And this congregation has a rich and wonderful history in both of those categories. And it is an honor for you and me to be able to contribute to that cause. There are various ways, as you can see on the screen, by which to contribute, and we encourage each and every one of us to give of our means as God has blessed us. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we're grateful for the blessings you shower upon us each and every day of our lives, for we know that in you we live and move and have our being. Help us to recognize always our dependence upon you and to use the blessings that you've provided as avenues by which to accomplish your will and to enrich the lives of others. Bless us as we give, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand again and sing.
boundless love, unending I'll be reading this morning from today's English version, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. My brothers, what good is it for someone to say that he has faith if his actions do not prove it? Can that faith save him? Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't? Give them the necessities of life. So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Well, good morning. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. It's good to have a great crowd here this morning. I've enjoyed uh, worshiping and singing with you. Thank you uh, to all the men who have led us so uh, in such a wonderful way this morning. Thank you for being here. We've got a good crowd this morning. I serve as the president of Jacob's Place, which is a homeless mission that services uh, families, uh, parents with children, uh, here in our community. And so I have a, uh, an understanding of the homelessness situation that seems to be an increasing situation here in Searcy. So I was enamored by a, an article that was written by a, a writer by the name of Alistair Gee in the online news source called The Guardian a few years ago that talked about how some major cities are dealing with their homeless situation, and it is to buy a one-way ticket, a bus ticket, for the homeless to any city of their choosing. And as the article went on, they figured that the best way to solve their problem was to let some other city and let other people deal with it so they would give them a, a, a one-way ticket anywhere they want to go. And I suppose that's probably a, a good way for a city to deal with that situation. But it's not how the church is to take care of the poor. Just giving people a one-way ticket out of town is a far different way of, of solution than what we just read about from James chapter 2 where James says, if you see a brother who's in need, who doesn't have anything to eat, doesn't have anything to drink, but you wish them well, hey, I, hey have a great day. Hope you're able to get a meal today. Hope you stay warm. But James says, you don't give them anything to eat. You don't give them anything warm to wear. He literally asked the question, what good is that? I mean, just say, be warmed and filled. What good is that? So we're going to talk about remembering the poor this morning because God brings people into our lives as an opportunity for us to grow in our faith, but also he brings them into our lives so that we might help them and provide for them. And we need to resist the temptation of passing them along to someone else to deal with. Do you realize that poverty has been the experience of much of humanity throughout all of history? 
Even in our nation, do you know that in America, before LBJ's domestic program called, called the Great Society, before Social Security was enacted in 1935, over half of the elderly people in our nation, this country, lived in poverty. And did you know over half of the people now living on the earth today live on $2.15 a day? Now, that's actually up from $1.90 not very many years ago. At least 80% of humanity today lives on less than $10 per day. That according to the World Bank update on the international poverty line. But did you also know that there are some 2,000 Bible verses in your Bible about God's deep concern for the working man? And the widow, the orphan, the homeless, the disabled, and the poor. Let's listen to God in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and hear what he thinks. Now he's writing to his people. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not go into his house to collect his pledge. You don't get to confiscate his property as collateral. You shall stand outside his house, and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. So God is going to protect the property and the dignity of the poor man. Uh, he'll bring that pledge out to you. If he is a poor man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall restore to him the pledge as the sun sets that he may be able to sleep in his, in his cloak. That's probably what he's used as a pledge. And he will bless you. And it shall be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. And you shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or a sojourner or a foreigner, a stranger in the land who is within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and he counts on it lest he cry against you to the Lord, and you be guilty of sin. Fathers shall not put to death, uh, be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless, or take a widow's garment in pledge. But you shall remember that you, one time you were in poor, poor shape, you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your har harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, oops, I forgot that, you shall not go back and get it. It shall be left there for the sojourner, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. And when you beat your olive trees... You shall not go over them again. Don't strip them absolutely bare. It, whatever remains on that tree, shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterwards. Don't pl pluck every last grape. It shall be there for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. God has a heart for the poor and the downtrodden. And did you know that helping or providing for the poor is such an essential tenet of the Christian faith that God actually used it when he, de when he defined what is pure religion? In James chapter 1 and verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, go visit the orphans. Go visit the widows and those in affliction. Just take care of the poor in general is what he's saying. And keep yourself unstained from this world. And did you know that one of the yardsticks by which one day each one of us is going to be judged by an almighty God is how did you help take care of those who are disadvantaged in life? those who are less fortunate in life. How did you take care of the poor? 
In Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 and 40, now in verse 33, remember, he separates the sheep who are on his right, your right, my left, and those who, the goats who are on his left, and he separates them and he says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You welcomed me. I was naked. You clothed me. I was in prison. You came to me. And those on the right are going to answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? Lord, we don't really remember you being a stranger. Lord, when is it you were naked? We don't, what are you talking about? And more importantly, when were you in prison? And Jesus says, when you do it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. When you took care of those who are least in our society, you are literally serving Jesus. And did you know that the, in the earliest congregation in the church, the church in Jerusalem, They made it their mission to remember the poor. They ensured that those who were in need among their group, every need that they had was met. It's in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 and following, that says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, But they had everything in common. They shared everything together. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. And there was not a needy person among them. Oh, outside the church there were plenty. But in the church, there wasn't any. For as many who... Who, who are owners of lands and houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what they had sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was detri- distributed to each one who had need. And then Luke gives this specific example. Thus Joseph, who is also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, native of Cyprus, he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, as you think about this text... One question that we ought to answer is, why were there so many poor Christians in the city of Jerusalem? Why were there so many Christians who were poor? Well, first of all, Jerusalem its city itself was a city that was filled with impoverished people. Because Jesus, Jews used Jerusalem as a destination place. For especially if you were really struggling, whatever part of the world you were, if you were really struggling as a Jew to make ends meet, you could travel to Jerusalem where as a Jew you could find lots of different ways and means by which to take care of yourself. I, as, as working with Jacob's Place years ago, not very many years ago, it was before COVID though, there was a, a woman and her son who came and, and they started to live at at Jacob's place and they called me and said they need a ride down to one of these consignment stores and there's a coupon where they could get some uh, additional clothes and things that they needed so I picked this woman and her son up took them to the consignment store and on the way there I asked them where do y'all come from they said we come from California well what brought you to Searcy who do you know here well we don't know anybody here so why are you in Searcy Arkansas from California she said We were told in California that Circe was the place to come because you could live on the sustenance of what the churches will provide. Now, in one sense, I was kind of disappointed that folks in in California are saying that and sending their problems here, so to speak. But in another way, I was quite proud of the churches, all churches here in, in Circe. That's what Jews would do from around the world. They would go to what was in essence their Mecca. And this is where they could be served, especially as people were going to the temple. They could ask for alms as people were going into the temple to worship. In fact, in Jewish religion, it was considered even especially righteous if you gave alms to the poor in the holy city, in the holy temple. 
But another reason, Jerusalem was also filled with elderly people. Many pious Jews wanted to be buried in the city of Jerusalem. So they may be living somewhere else, but when they get later in years and want to be buried in Jerusalem, they would travel and live in Jerusalem and they would, they, they would sustain themselves off of the, the free will offerings and givings of people who were in Jerusalem. So many of them came so that they might be buried in the holy city. Third, many of the first responders or responses to the message of Jesus and the, and the kingdom of God were from among the poor. When Jesus announced the inauguration of his ministry in the synagogue, and he was reading from Isaiah 61 and verse 1, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. That's one of the ways you'll know he's the Messiah, is he will preach to the poor. Later, when Jesus wants to convince John the Baptist, who has asked a question, sent messengers to Jesus asking the question, are you really the Messiah? Jesus sends a message back with those messengers to John saying this in Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5. Go tell John what you've heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Out of all of the evidence that would point to who is the Messiah, the crown jewel of this evidence is that the gospel is preached to the poor. And Jesus wasn't born into a well-to-do family. He was born at least into a blue-collar family, the son of a carpenter. But I think he had an affinity for those who were poor and less fortunate. After all, he made the beggar man, Lazarus, the hero of one of his parables. Dale talked about the widow who gave the, the two mites. The very least amount of anybody, but maybe gave the most of everyone. And he also, um, it also says in Mark chapter 12 and verse 37, I like how the New King James puts it, the common people heard him gladly. Which reminds me of the Abraham Lincoln statement that said, the Lord must love the common man, he made so many of them. Jesus appealed to the common man, the poor man. They were among the first to respond to the message of the gospel. There's another reason that there were so many poor in Jerusalem. It was often the case that Christians were discriminated, discriminated against because of their faith. Once a person put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah, many of the Jews and who were merchants and businessmen, they would close their doors to Christians. They would neither buy or sell to Christians because of their faith. And for that reason, there were Jewish Christians who might not otherwise be poor who became poor because of their faith. And then number five, there were the natural disasters that brought added hardship to those in Jerusalem. Historians tell us that in the years between A.D. 41 and A.D. 54, an unusual number of natural disasters struck the area of Judea and Jerusalem, including earthquakes, famine, pestilence. And you know what happens when there is a, a natural disaster in an area? Inflation. Prices go skyrocketing, skyrocketing high. Josephus records that in a matter of just one week, four liters of wheat, the basic food staple among the Jews, four liters of wheat rose 13 times its original price. And we have some recent experience. What happens to prices when there is a disaster or a pandemic? We know what can happen, and, and the Jews experienced it over and over again. Now, you put all of those factors together, and it's understandable why there were so many poor Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 6, the very first official ministry of the church was a widow's ministry especially to the Grecian widows. And the Apostle Paul always encouraged the churches where he would establish a church or work with the Gentile church. He would always uh, encourage them to be generous. And especially when there was a famine. When, in Acts chapter 11, when they heard about the prophecy that there was going to be a famine in Jerusalem, the first thing that the church in Antioch, a Gentile church, did was take up a collection to send back to Jerusalem because when that famine hits, they're going to be in need. 
And that was a Gentile church helping a poor, impoverished Jewish church, which helps to explain Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 and following, when Paul says, 14 years later, on one of those visits, we don't know which one, could be Acts 11, could be Acts 15, could be another, but on one of these visits, I was in Jerusalem and I met with Peter, James, and John, leaders, apostles in that church, and, and they gave me the right hand of fellowship, Paul says, but they also made a request. Remember the poor. And Paul says, I had no problem with that. I always intended to help and remember the poor. You see, caring for the less fortunate in, in our culture, in our society, is central to the mission of the Lord's church. That's why our leaders in this congregation always make sure that we have a very generous, benevolent ministry in this congregation. Galatians 6 and verse 10, very familiar verse, says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those of the household of faith. Paul says charity begins at home in the family of God. And our first priority in this church, and you heard one of the announcements today regarding that, our first priority in this church is to help take care of those in need in this church family first. And then beyond that, we also respond to many needs in this community, in our state, and throughout the world in a number of ways. We provide weekly support for his house and the Monday night caring and sharing. A good portion of the Great Commission Sunday contribution that you gave last month, a good portion of that will go to help to meet the needs of suffering orphans and families around the world. When war broke out in, the, in U Ukraine... Remember those buckets? This congregation generously helped fill hundreds and hundreds of those buckets that were shipped to, to Poland, as I recall, to help meet the needs and give the daily needs for those who had been displaced from their home. We did that because of generosity that's in our heart. We participate. There's, I think there's only a few of these cans, but these uh, cans, uh, children uh, change for, for uh, uh, cans uh, that, in this case, go to Paragould for the Children's Homes Incorporated. Uh, every year, you fill up a, a large number of those cans that give a few thousand dollars at least uh, to those good works and help take care of children who don't have parents who are able to do that for them. Then we have our school supply drive. We have the coat drive. We have our holiday gift outreach that blesses people and blesses our families during the fall season. Many of you are involved in disaster relief, that ministry. Then you will travel east, west, north, south, wherever there has been a flood or tornado. And you primarily help families who do not have the insurance and the financial means to get themselves back up on their feet alone. And you go help those who are in need. And I know firsthand of several families that I could I'm seeing their faces now and I could tell you their names but I won't but I, I've lost count how many times members of this church have have come to me or contact the church office and said hey there's a family that I know about in need I want to give them anonymously I want to give them some help and so you give some cash, you give a check, you do it anonymously, but the church has been used as a, as a way for members of this church to help bless the lives of other members of this church. And for all of that, you're to be commended. Because despite all of the poverty in the city of Jerusalem, in the Lord's church, there wasn't anyone who had a real need. They took care of one another. So why do we do all this? Why do the elders, the deacons, and even members of this church, why do they do all of this for those who are less fortunate? Well, first and foremost, because God told us, remember the poor. And because we cannot be a church of Christ without following the example of Christ, and Christ took care of the poor, and he taught the poor. And because we want to be a New Testament church, which means we follow the example of the New Testament church, which was taking care of those less fortunate. And because one day, we are all going to be held accountable for the way we individually have taken care of those who are far less fortunate than ourselves. And because we also believe that God will bless giving, loving, serving Christians 
who remember the poor. This past Thursday, we celebrated Thanksgiving. It's a marvelous holiday because it's different from July 4th where we celebrate our independence. On Thanksgiving, we celebrate our dependence on God. The one in whom we move, we breathe, we have our very existence. We couldn't live or exist another day without the blessings of God, and we acknowledge Him. And we acknowledge that, in many ways, we are, we're all charity cases of God. He takes care of us. It's in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, He became poor for your sake and for mine. And through his poverty, we might become rich. And we have. Not only do we have all of our daily sustenance taken care of by a mighty and a holy God, but he also takes care of every eternal need that we have for salvation. And right now, he's taking care of us on this earth, and he's building for us a home in heaven where we will spend the rest of eternity with him. We love and serve and praise a wonderful, loving God who has blessed us richly through Jesus Christ, and he calls us to remember those who are poor. Can we remember you this morning? Maybe there's a need that someone has to become a Christian, to hear the good news and respond to that by faith, to repent of sin, and to turn their lives over to God by way of baptism for the forgiveness of sin. But maybe you have a need that we could pray for you or encourage you somehow. So whether you're online with us or in person, let us know how we can serve you as together we stand now and we sing. Make me a Father, as we come to a close of our assembly time together this morning, we want to pause and, and thank you for the abundant blessings that you send our way. For the good news of Katie Tripp's baptism, for the wonderful service that Dr. John Baines has provided for us as a shepherd these many years, and now as he steps down and, and is married and embarking on a new path in life, we pray that we will embrace the pledge that he encouraged us to remember. Father, we thank you for uh, our time together this morning, for, for no lessons, for reminding us to remember the poor. Father, for the, the burden that you have placed on our heart, for those who are hurting and those who are lost, we're grateful. May you continue to soften our hearts. Help us to seize opportunities and to look for opportunities to serve. We thank you for the service that you provided us by the gift of your son, for his example of service, whether it was washing feet or dying on the cross. We thank you for that tremendous love. We ask a special prayer for those of our 
students who are traveling back for the resumption of, uh, of classes tomorrow, give them safe travel, and we're grateful for those who have already arrived. Father, help us to look forward to a great finish to this calendar year and the many opportunities we have to glorify you. Forgive us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.